I'll start the video here. There we go. All right, so if you haven't already, get out your balloons. Only you And we're going to have lots of dolls. Yeah. 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 which when we look at this big picture now, it's kind of busy here. Um, but we talked about oxidative phosphorylation, the role of the electron transport chain, and chemiosmosis. And so we put it all together with this picture. It shows you how much ATP is made in each step, gives you totals, um, and so on. And so, uh, so the last step is really, really important to get to um, because it makes the most ATP. The first, what's the purpose of the first steps, the glycolysis, uh, the intermediate step in the citric acid cycle, what's its purpose? Um, Maria? To make the electron carriers. That's right, to make all the electron carriers, NADH, FADH2, so all of these electron carriers are bringing electrons to this last step. And so, uh, so that step is really, really important. Oh. For cellular respiration to occur, one of the reactants is oxygen. Uh, what is the purpose of oxygen? Why is oxygen so important in cellular respiration? Roman. That's right, it's the last electron acceptor because it is the most electronegative of the whole, all the molecules in the electron transport chain. So remember, that all these electron carriers are bringing electrons into the electron transport chain. As the electrons move through the electron transport chain, um, it, they eventually reach oxygen and are eventually in a molecule of water. Why is it important that the electrons move through the electron transport chain? Why is that process important that they move through the electron transport chain? Uh, chain? It the, the electrons are moving through, the electrons come from the NADH, yeah. so the electrons move through. The H pluses are just net found in the matrix okay. here, which is the so, space. Yeah, and, and then moving through that, just taking the H pluses out of the matrix, out into like the, the I can think of what it's called. Intermembrane yeah, space. Intermembrane, and then that creates a higher concentration on the outside. All right. So yes, so what, when the H pluses, I'm gonna hold you there for a second. So when the H pluses move from the matrix into the intermembrane space, is this active or passive transport? This is active, it requires energy from low to high concentration. Let me ask you this, where does that energy come from to move the H pluses from the matrix to the intermembrane space? Where does that energy come from? The movement of electrons to the different acceptors across the membrane to the proteins. Yeah, the movement of the electrons. So what the, when the, the electrons are moved from one molecule or one protein to another in the electron transport chain, that's a series of oxidation reduction reactions. So when the molecule gets the electrons, it becomes reduced, but then it passes it on to the next molecule. So I become oxidized, the next molecule becomes reduced. And these series of redox reactions of this happening releases energy. That energy is used to pump the H pluses in the intermembrane space. So next question, why is it important to have a high concentration of H pluses in the intermembrane space? So why do we need this to happen so that we have a high concentration of H pluses in the intermembrane space? What's the role of the H pluses? Why do we need to have that high concentration of H pluses? We need it to change the shape of ATP synthase so that it can um, ATP. Yeah, and ATP synthase only changes shape when what happens? The H plus is diffused through. So if you have a high concentration of H pluses on this side of the inner membrane, the H pluses will go from high to low concentration 
through the ATP synthase, which is sage side changes the shape of it, allowing ADP and the phosphate to fit into the active site, and therefore it phosphorylates or adds the phosphate on the ADP to make ATP. That process only occurs when ATP synthase changes shape, and it only changes shape when H plus is diffused through here. So, so therefore, we always need a high concentration out here in the inner membrane space so that we can always make ATP, so this enzyme will continue to work. Um, and so the electron transport chain creates that situation for us, all right? And so, so oxygen is very important because it's what allows the electron transport chain to occur, which ultimately is what allows ATP to be made by the um, ATP synthase being able to be in the right shape. So oxygen, very, very important. Um, so I just asked a bunch of series of questions here. If you are, hopefully you sat there and tried to answer the questions, but if you sat there and you don't know the answers to the questions, um, that tells you that you need to be doing a lot more study, all right? So, so you need to spend time and you should be able to answer things like that, okay? And so, so you have one week, all right? And then you have it. Okay, so, um, so what we're going to look at today is what happens when a cell does not get oxygen. All right, so all of this happens in the presence of oxygen and we get 36 to 38 ATP. So the next slide is about a process called fermentation. It enables some cells to produce ATP without the use of oxygen. Cellular respiration requires O2 to produce ATP. It can produce, glycolysis can produce ATP with or without oxygen. In the absence of oxygen, glycolysis couples with fermentation to produce ATP. So let me go over what this means. So I had erased up here the first step so I have the intermediate step, citric acid cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation. What's the first step? Glycolysis. So let's just go, uh, I'm going to rewrite this here to kind of get us into this mindset here. So glycolysis. Glycolysis is taking glucose and converting it into two pyruvates. Normally, um, the pyruvate will now enter the mitochondria, get concerned converted to acetyl-CoA, which enters into the citric acid cycle. And the purpose of all these is to <clears throat> generate um, electron carriers. Now notice here, I put, I left from last hour, I put in the presence of oxygen. So what happens is the rest of cellular respiration and therefore the electron transport chain with, um, can only occur if there's oxygen present. So all these NADHs that are made in FADH2s if you don't have oxygen, it doesn't matter because the electron transport chain isn't going to occur without oxygen. So what happens is the rest of this and, and the majority of your ATP, only, you only get that with oxygen. And so glycolysis, we just wrote, can produce ATP with or without oxygen. So this can happen with no oxygen. The rest of it can only happen with oxygen. So what are we missing here? So in glycolysis, um, uh, we make a little bit of ATP. Does everybody remember how many we make total? The net? Two. Two. I should fill up my hair. Two ATP. So out of this, um, you come out with two ATP. To make two ATP, what would need to go in? How do you make ATP? Eight. We need two ADPs, right? Yes. And two phosphates. All right, to make two ATP. And this is our net gain from glycolysis. So we get a little bit of ATP from glycolysis. Um, also, in the series of reactions that converts glucose to pyruvate, you also make something else. Does everybody remember what the second thing you make is? Or the third? So we get two pyruvate, two ATP. What's the, what's the main purpose of glycolysis? NADH, right? So we make there's two of them. And so to make NADH, you guys remember what you need? What would have to go NA, in to so these plus. reactions? Yeah, yeah, you need NAD plus and hydrogen, two hydrogens. They take the hydrogen off of the intermediates. Because the, remember, from glucose to pyruvate, 
is a series of reactions. So we take the hydrogens off of these intermediates here to make your NADH. So we need two NAD pluses that come in, react with some of the hydrogens in these intermediates, and then we get NADH. And so that's glycolysis. And so this can occur um, with no oxygen. So if you have a cell that you're not giving oxygen to, all right? So there are certain bacteria, um, yeast to do this. Um, and so if you're not giving any oxygen to, this is the only thing that they can do, glycolysis. Glycolysis would, they're not gonna do any of this other stuff and get your majority of your ATP. So with uh, a cell that doesn't have oxygen or is in an anaerobic condition, this means no oxygen, without the presence of oxygen. Aerobic means with oxygen. We don't know those words. Um, so if you have this anaerobic condition in the cell and a glucose molecule comes into the cell, what's the maximum number of ATP that the cell can make with no oxygen? A glucose molecule comes into the cell. What's the maximum amount of ATP that they can make? 36. With no oxygen, what's the only part of cellular respiration they can do? Glycolysis. Glycolysis. This is the only thing that happens with no oxygen because the rest of this has to have the oxygen present. So the maximum number of ATP that you can make per glucose molecule is two. Two. All right. And so, um, so that's what happens with no oxygen. Question. What, what happens with the NADH then? Doesn't that go to the uh, electron transport? Chain? Yeah. This NADH is supposed to go to the electron transport chain, but the electron transport chain with no oxygen uh, doesn't yeah. happen. So it starts to build up is what happens, all right? And so, <laughs> so, which kind of brings me to this next point here. So let's pretend that, again, another glucose comes in. They go, break it down into two pyruvate, but the rest of this doesn't happen. You get a little bit of ATP, and you use up two more NAD pluses to make NADH. Now let me talk about NAD pluses. NAD pluses and NADH. Remember these guys, the NAD pluses, they're naturally found in the cell. They, they um, become NADH by getting, gaining electrons, and they come over here to the electron transport train, drop off the electrons, and the NADH becomes then again NAD plus. Then the NAD pluses can go, pick, them up, pick up more electrons, become NADH, come to the electron transport train, drop them off, and become NAD plus. So they're constantly becoming NAD plus, um, going back and picking up electrons, becoming NADH, dropping them off at the electron transport chain, and becoming NAD plus. So that's their cycle there. So what's happening if there's no oxygen is is that the the NAD pluses are becoming NADHs, but are the NADHs ever dropping them off at the electron transport chain? No, because there are no oxygen. So imagine, like, so let's say the cell has some NAD pluses. Let me just put a few drawings here of NAD pluses. So glucose comes into the cell, converts to 2-pyruvate, makes 2 ATP, and in this process uses up 2 NAD pluses, and now the NAD pluses are NADHs. NADHs stay NADHs because they're not, they're not dropping the electrons off, and that's all you can do with one glucose molecule. Next glucose comes in, goes converted to 2-pyruvate, makes 2 ATP, converts two more NAD pluses to NADH, but they stay NADH because they're not dropping them off. Do you see that if, if this cell stays in a condition with no oxygen, that they can eventually run out of NAD pluses, all right? If you run out of NAD pluses, can glycolysis occur? No, it's part of the reaction process. If glycolysis doesn't occur, can they make any ATP now? No. So in this case then, if, if, if glycolysis occurs and you run out of NAD pluses, that cell is going to die very, very quickly. Because this little process here of making 2 ATP is what's keeping it alive in the absence of oxygen. And so in comes this, this um, reaction called fermentation. So that's what we're going to look at next. Fermentation, we're going to see, helps to replenish and put the NAD pluses back so that you can continue to do glycolysis with no oxygen. So fermentation consists of glycolysis plus reactions that regenerate NAD plus, which can be reused by glycolysis. Two common types of alcohol fermentation 
are, are sorry, two types of fermentation are alcohol fermentation and lactic acid fermentation. We're going to look at both of those. All right. So in alcohol fermentation, pyruvate is converted to a molecule called ethanol in two steps, with the first releasing CO2. Alcohol fermentation by yeast is used in brewing, winemaking, and baking. So we use this process to help us out a little bit. So this picture shows you this. So let me explain what we're looking at. So just to kind of break it down here, I'm gonna put a line here through this. So this process right here on the top of this line is glycolysis. What it happens after this is part of the fermentation process. And it breaks it down. So if we just look at the top of this, this is what we just talked about. So glucose during glycolysis broken down into two pyruvate, makes two ATP, uses two NAD pluses, and those are converted to two NADHs. So that's this process right here. So this can occur with or without oxygen. So if there's oxygen, I'm gonna put an arrow here, with O2, where's this pyruvate gonna go? It's gonna go into the mitochondria and it's gonna do the rest of cellular respiration. It's gonna be used to an intermediate step and so on and so forth and the rest of cellular respiration happens with oxygen present. Um, this arrow here shows you what happens when there's no O2, and that's when fermentation occurs. So if we look here, we said alcohol fermentation is a two-step process. So instead of the pyruvate going in the mitochondria, it stays here in the cytoplasm and gets converted to two acetyl aldehydes. What comes off? Two CO2s. This is a waste product. So CO2 comes off. That's the first step. The second step is the, the yeast converts the acetyl aldehyde to ethanol. Ethanol ends in OL. That means it's an alcohol. Alcohol has the hydroxyl group attached, remember, and that makes it an alcohol. So this is why this is called alcohol fermentation, because the end product at the end is an alcohol. But guess what? This is also a waste product. So yeast do this. So if this is a little yeast and you put in there in an anaerobic condition, they'll go through glycolysis, make some ATP, um, and convert the pyruvate eventually to alcohol. The yeast does not want carbon dioxide or alcohol. That's not why they do this process. Why do they, do, why do they convert pyruvate to alcohol, to the ethanol? What's the purpose of the conversion of pyruvate to ethanol? They need NAD plus to do glycolysis. So therefore, this process of converting the acetaldehyde to ethanol takes the NADH that were made and converts them into NAD plus. So this regenerates NAD plus so that glycolysis can continue to happen. And that's the, that's the purpose of it. And so now, the next glucose that comes in, you're never gonna run out of NAD pluses because the fermentation process is gonna regenerate them. And so therefore, yeast, yeast is actually an organism that can live indefinitely without oxygen. That they can go through this and the, the ATP that they get from glycolysis, as long as they keep, keep getting a supply of glucose, um, they can live and that's enough energy for them. That, that's not enough energy for our cells, but it is for them, all right? And so, so that is alcohol fermentation. And we use this, the last bullet talked about how we use this process in brewing beer, for instance. So it's a multi-billion dollar industry where we use alcohol fermentation that happens in yeast um, in the brewing process. So what happens in brewing, the brewing process, is we put yeast, the yeast in an anaerobic condition where you're not, they don't give them any oxygen. It forces them 
than to go through alcohol fermentation. So what happens is to stay alive. And so what happens in that fermentation process to regenerate the NAD plus so the, the yeast can continue to survive, they release CO2. CO2 is what adds carbonation. All right, uh, to the beverage, and then um, they produce alcohol, and that's the alcohol content um, in the in the drink. All right, um, we also use yeast for baking. So when we bake uh, uh, and put yeast in our doughs and things like that, what we do is we create an anaerobic situation. Let me explain. Like if you buy a little package of yeast, yeast it's, it's dry, it's in what we call the dormant state, um, which means that it's alive. Yeast is a fungus, so the, the yeast is alive, it's a living thing, but it doesn't have any water or anything like that in the package state, so it's dormant, which means that it's doing just the bare minimum to stay alive. Uh, and so what we do is we activate the yeast so you can put it into warm water. The, the, both the water and the warm temperature activates it. And so now the yeast kind of comes out of dormancy, so it starts to do cellular respiration more and so on. So, so it's doing cellular respiration. And then what you do is then put that yeast and you mix it with the flour and the water and stuff like that and you make this dough. Well, all this yeast now is stuck in the dough. Most of the yeast don't have access now to the atmosphere, so they don't have any oxygen. And so you've created an anaerobic situation in this dough for this yeast. So what do they do when there's no oxygen? The yeast goes through glycolysis, but then goes through alcohol fermentation to, um, to um, regenerate the NAD plus so they can stay living in your dough. So <clears throat> what's released? CO2 and ethanol. The CO2 released from your yeast in your dough causes your dough to do what? That's why it rises, all right? So it rises, and inside of there, you have all these little air bubbles. What's in the air? All the CO2 from the fermentation. Yes? What about the alcohol in, in bread? <laughs> so but alcohol, what happens is when you bake it, it burns off, it boils off. All right, yes, yes, all right, so it boils off. And, um, and so, and it's not enough. The quantity that you use in a typical baking situation, unless you let it sit there for forever to do, you know, the amount of time, it's not gonna be enough alcohol to, you know, really make that much of a difference anyway, but it does, but it does boil off in the in the baking process, all right? And so that's how we use this process and our understanding of this process to do a few things, all right? So that is yeast with alcohol fermentation. There's another type of fermentation called lactic acid fermentation where pyruvate is reduced to NADH and then we form lactate as an end product. And no CO2 is released in this process. So what kind of organisms do this? Some bacteria and other fungus. Um, we use this to make some cheeses and yogurts. Uh, our human muscle cells also use lactic acid fermentation to generate ATP when oxygen is scarce. <clears throat> so this process is very similar to the alcohol fermentation. So I'm going to draw the line here and kind of goes here. So this part right here, just like before, is glycolysis. And then the, in lactic acid fermentation, it's a little simpler. At the end of glycolysis, the pyruvate um, is converted to lactate. So this is with no oxygen. Remember again, just like before, with oxygen, it's gonna to go to the mitochondria and the rest of cellular respiration would happen. But um, since we're talking about with no oxygen, and so it gets converted to lactate and again, regenerates here, regenerates your NAD plus. So the purpose is still the same, it's just how they do it is a little different. We take pyruvate and convert it to lactate. Now notice here the name is lactic acid fermentation. Let me talk about um, the relationship between lactate and lactic acid. This guy right here is your carboxyl group. Carboxyl group is the acidic, gives the uh, acidic uh, properties to the molecule that it has. So what basically, when it's, uh, the pyruvate first gets converted to lactic acid. Lactic acid is, would have an H here. And so the C double bonded to an O and an OH, that's your carboxyl group. And acid gives H pluses in solution. 
So when it acts as an acid and gives off the H+, plus, that's when it has the OH negative, and that's when we call it lactate. So lactate is lactic acid that is already given off at the H+. Plus. All right, it acted as an acid. So really, lactic acid is, is produced, which immediately gives off its H+, plus, and then you end up with lactate. All right, and it regenerates the um, NAD+. Plus. And so we said, I used the example of this being in human muscle cells. Um, when oxygen is scarce. Do you have a question? Um, all right, so in the last diagram and this diagram, it says plus 2H block. Is that uh, right next to 2 NADH? Is that getting added to the NADH? No. In this conversion here, um, the NAD plus, when it goes into this reaction, um, it takes two hydrogen from an intermediate from a molecule. So molecule X has two hydrogens attached to it. And so, so in order for this to, to be converted to this, it takes two hydrogen off of there. So the hydrogen, remember, has a proton in the nucleus and an electron spinning around. And so, so there's two of those here. All right, so there's two hydrogen that's taken off of a molecule here. So for NAD+, plus, remember, to be... To be neutralized, one of the electrons goes to neutralize the the um, the positive, and then the this is a whole H atom. So then the H gets attached here, all right, and so we end up with NADH. So what you end up with is having a hydrogen that's lost an electron to neutralize that. You have that left over. So and since you have this happens twice, you have two H pluses left over. That's why. So these are extra. From the, that process. Okay. Does it make and sense? Then what happens to those? Is it just there after? No, yeah, yeah. And so, yes, and they can be used. Yes, they, they can and be used they can to be make more. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay, yeah. I was confused. Okay, yep, yeah, it's okay. Alrighty, so, um, what was I at? Oh, I was going to talk about the human muscle cells. So, when oxygen is scarce, so, in our muscle cells, we can create a situation in our body that we have an anaerobic situation in a part of our body while we're still breathing. So this doesn't mean for lactic acid and fermentation to occur in our muscle cells that we have to hold our breath and not breathe, all right? So what happens is, is that muscle cells we use a lot, they use a lot of ATP. We need a lot of cellular respiration to regenerate the ATP because we use a lot of it. So there can become a time when you use a muscle so much that it's using up the ATP so much in those cells that you can't go through cellular respiration fast enough to replenish the ATP. So, and you can't also deliver oxygen fast enough. How does oxygen get delivered to the cells, like in your muscle cells? You breathe it in and it goes in from your lungs to your bloodstream, right? And that carries it to the rest of your body and delivers it to all your cells. And so when you use a muscle in those cells a lot, your body is delivering oxygen to it, but it may be that your muscles are going through cellular respiration at such a fast rate to replenish the ATP that you can't get enough oxygen there fast enough. So what you've done is you've created kind of like an anaerobic low oxygen state in just a part of your body versus your whole body. And so um, uh, for, so you may have experienced that in, in, in an exercise form um, where if you if you're a runner or lift weights or something like that, um, that you've uh, created that situation. If you, you know, how many people have had anatomy here? All right, a few people. All right, in anatomy, um, uh, we do a semi-torturous lab um, where they they take a kind of ball like a tennis ball and um, hold it in between their um, their. Uh, uh, fingers and thumb and you have to squeeze like this as fast as you can and indent um, and so you're using the muscle very very quickly you're still the or the pe person the organism the person is still breathing but you're using this muscle so fast that the oxygen delivery is not as efficient as it should be and because and so they're going through cellular respiration at a fast rate so you create an anaerobic situation there which means that the muscle cells start doing Lactic acid fermentation, lactic acid starts building up, and eventually it causes you feel what? Sore, all right, and it can be painful as well, all right, a little bit, I think it's.
anyway. Um, and that causes you to do what? Slow down, right? Why is that beneficial? That's a beneficial thing that your pain causes you to stop because these cells are being used so much that you're not getting oxygen to them. If you use them too much and they're not getting oxygen, is it possible that they could eventually die? It could, they could, but our body doesn't let that happen because it makes it impossible to keep on doing that um, to that particular body part, all right? And so so that is lactic acid. And so I just want to point that out that, that for us with the human muscle cells, it's not like the organism isn't getting any oxygen, but there's just parts of the body that are not getting enough oxygen, all right? All righty. So <laughs> comparing then fermentation to to cellular respiration. Both processes use glycolysis to oxidize glucose. Oxidize means to lose electrons. This says in or, other organic fuels, we'll see that other fuels can be enter into the cellular respiration process. The process is of different final electron acceptors at the end of um, uh, for fermentation, you have an organic molecule like pyruvate, and at the end of cellular respiration, the final electron acceptor is oxygen. And hopefully you realize that cellular respiration produces way more ATP than glycolysis followed by fermentation. All right, so yeast, we talked about yeast and how they do alcohol fermentation. Yeast in many bacteria are what we call facultative anaerobes. They can survive using either fermentation or cellular respiration. They can survive with or without oxygen and be just fine. In a facultative anaerobe, this cracks me up, pyruvate is a fork in the metabolic road that leads to two alternative catabolic routes. <laughs> I like to think I'm gonna pause about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, what does that mean? So in a yeast that can survive with or without oxygen, the fork in the road is right here. There's the fork. Pyruvate can go this way or this way. And there's your fork. Uh, it doesn't matter for a yeast. So a yeast can take glucose, convert it to pyruvate. That's glycolysis. And if there's no oxygen present, they go through fermentation. And then that, um, it produces um, uh, ethanol and then they next glucose they come in and so they are able to survive just by doing uh, glycolysis and that's enough ATP for them or if there's oxygen present that's cool too and they can go through the rest of cellular respiration and survive just fine either way all right we on the other hand our muscle cells when we go in this direction with no oxygen we can't survive long term this way, all right? This just allows us for a certain amount of time. Eventually, we need oxygen to go this way. Is there only muscle cells that do that? Yeah, so it's not all cells. All right, yes, absolutely. Okay, so in glycolysis, they I think this is pretty significant that the fact that glycolysis is the only part of cellular respiration that can occur without oxygen. And so uh, one thing that all cells basically have in common is the process of glycolysis. Um, and so uh, they think that um, glycolysis uh, probably um, was even present in ancient prokaryotes. Prokaryotes, remember, are like bacteria. Do prokaryotic cells have a nucleus? Um, no, they do not have a nucleus and they don't have a mitochondria either, which is what I meant to say. All right, and so they don't have a mitochondria, no organelles. And so therefore, um, it makes sense that ancient prokaryotes, um, if they don't have any organelles, they're still able to do glycolysis. And the fact that glycolysis can go uh, can occur without oxygen, um, in ancient um, days, that, uh, it is thought that there was no oxygen in the atmosphere, so organisms could still survive in um, uh, an atmosphere with no oxygen can still survive um, using just glycolysis. All right, so the next section is about um, two things. We're gonna look at the fact that glucose isn't the only molecule that can enter into this process. And then we're gonna look at how we regulate this process and turn it on and off. So it's kind of a review from um, chapter eight we talked about.
All right, so catabolism, releasing energy. Catabolic pathways funnel electrons from many kinds of organic molecules into cellular respiration. Glycolysis accepts a wide range of carbohydrates. Proteins can also be used. Proteins must be digested into amino acids. And the amino groups can feed glycolysis of the citric acid cycle. And fats are also digested to glycerol and fatty acids. And the glycerol can be used in glycolysis and the fatty acid is, can be um, converted into acetyl-CoA. The last thing, an oxidized gram of fat produces more than twice as much ATP as an oxidized gram of carbohydrate. So what we're going to see in this next picture is that we don't have to start at the beginning with glucose and it doesn't, glucose isn't the only molecule that can go through this process. We're going to see that other molecules can enter in at various stages in this process and produce some ATP. <coughs> and so that's what this is showing you. Let's look at the center first because that's what we're familiar with, carbohydrates, sugar, like glucose. So notice the, the arrow straight down. This box is glycolysis, then the immediate group, inter, uh, intermediate step, and then citric acid cycle, oxidative phosphorylation. So this is the whole process of cellular respiration. So if sugar, like glucose, glucose enters at the very beginning and makes a, the maximum amount of ATP. Um, other, this other arrow here, notice that from sugar it goes down here into the middle here. With it, remember that like from here to here and from here to here is not just one simple step, but there are lots of steps that are intermediate between here. So this arrow here is showing you that there are other sugars like fructose or um, galactose uh, that can enter into glycolysis, but they don't necessarily enter at the beginning. So they enter and are converted to other molecules in the glycolysis process and eventually convert to pyruvate, which then can go to the rest of the, um, go through the rest of cellular respiration. So other sugar molecules can be used. Um, let's look at proteins. Proteins, when we um, eat proteins, they're digested into amino acids. Carbohydrates were digested into sh single sugars and proteins are digested in amino acids. Depending upon the amino acid, there are 20 different types of amino acids. The amino acids can enter into the process at different points. So some amino acids can enter here. The, what does that mean? That an amino acid that was once part of our protein can be converted to pyruvate and then go through the rest of cellular respiration, which means that some ATP can be made from the energy that was in that amino acid once it gets converted to pyruvate. Some amino acids, can be converted to acetyl-CoA. And again, once that happens, the acetyl-CoA enters the citric acid cycle, it makes some NADHs and FADH2s, which then can be responsible to make some ATP. And then the same thing with other amino acids can enter in as one of the intermediates of the citric acid cycle and uh, make some electron carriers to make ATP. So we can get energy from our proteins. And then when we break down the proteins, this is waste. So that can be given off as waste. All right, and then um, fats. So, <laughs> oh, let me ask you this. One amino acid compared to one glucose molecule, which one do you think makes more ATP and why? One amino acid compared to one glucose molecule. Which one makes more ATP and why? Raise your hand if you think you can tell me an answer. <laughs> yeah. If you compare one amino acid to one glucose molecule, which one would make more ATP and why? Roman. Okay, glucose is the right answer. Why? It enters what? Glucose does what? Yeah, even this amino acid that enters at the highest point towards the beginning, 
gets converted to pyruvate, whereas glucose has to go through this whole step here to be converted to pyruvate. What's the importance of this? Does anything happen here in glycolysis? Two ATP are made, right? And so therefore, we make more ATP that way. All right, very good. And lastly, fats. On uh, fats, we have, <coughs> let me just review, fats, glycerol, and three fatty acids. We have three fatty acids here. Fatty acids are really long chains of what two atoms? They're hydrocarbons, which are carbons and hydrogens, right? And so there's lots of hydrogens attached to these. And so when we say that when we eat a glycerol or eat a fat, we break it down into glycerol and three fatty acids here. The glycerol can be converted to um, glyceraldehyde three phosphate, which is an intermediate in glycolysis, and so therefore we can get some ATP from that. The fatty acids can be converted to acetyl CoA, which we can get um, energy from that. Let me ask you this: We wrote down here this last bullet on the previous one. An oxidized gram of fat produces more than twice as much ATP as an oxidized gram of carbohydrates. Um, why is it that we would get twice as much ATP from a fat molecule like this versus a gram of glucose? Aren't fatty acids, since they've got so many, uh, sorry, they have so much more hydrogens than a glucose molecule, molecule wouldn't there be more NADH produced and then produce the electron transport chain? Absolutely, absolutely. Remember, when we take glucose and we we strip the electrons, the electrons are coming from the hydrogen. And so fatty acids, there uh, there's three fatty acids on one triglyceride, and they can be a hundred long, you know, they can be really, really long. And so you have all these hydrogens. And so therefore we can, as as Katie said, there's we can make way more NADHs from that, and therefore there's more electrons to actually strip off of the, the fatty acids than there is actual glucose. So absolutely. And that's also why we don't need very much fat in our diet because we can get so much energy from fat and so um, and so much ATP so oftentimes if we eat a lot of triglycerides then we our body ends up storing it because uh, we don't need it for energy all right not everything we eat though is actually used for energy so we also use it to build. So that's biosynthesis or anabolic pathways. The body also uses small molecules to build other substances. And so they can, they can come from food uh, and so on. So what we can, we use some of the amino acids instead of for energy. Actually, most amino acids, when we eat protein, we use those amino acids to build human protein. So you eat some a fish, let's say. Um, and you digest those fish proteins into amino acids and then those amino acids go to our cells and we put them together to make human proteins. So that is biosynthesis. So not everything that we eat or take in is used for energy, but also for building. All right. And so we also have to have a way to regulate cellular respiration. So um, this is tying into last chapter, all right, with regulating enzymes. Feedback inhibition is the most common mechanism for control. If ATP concentration begins to drop, then respiration speeds up. And when there's plenty of ATP, respiration slows down. So the control of catabolism is based mainly on regulating the activity of enzymes at strategic points in the catabolic pathway. Where did we learn is the best place to control an enzyme in a pathway? At the beginning, right? Um, that way you're not wasting and doing a whole bunch of steps that you don't need, which is what this picture is showing you here. So this is, did I go too fast? Yes. Showing us, let's go through this real quickly here. Um, this is glycolysis, intermediate step citric acid cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation. Here's an enzyme. This right here, this enzyme, notice here is inhibited 
by ATP and inhibited by a molecule called citrate from the citric acid cycle. And it's stimulated by AMP. So this molecule can be stimulated or inhibited. If you recall from last chapter, molecule or enzymes that can do that are called allosteric enzymes. So this is an allosteric enzyme, which means an activator or an inhibitor can make it work or not make it work. So, so notice here, ATP is made in glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation. So if ATP builds up and is not being used, guess what? We don't need to go through this process as much. So ATP buildup causes and inhibits that enzyme at the first step. So that's the first step of cellular respiration. Citric acid cycle, this is citrate. Citrate is the first molecule made in the citric acid cycle. First molecule made in citric acid cycle. So if this builds up, it is not being used, that means the citric acid cycle is not occurring, then it inhibits that enzyme. So we can stop that enzyme from working. What stimulates that enzyme? AMP. AMP, if, is, if we take ATP and break it down into ADP, normally we put the phosphate back on and make more ATP, but if you're in dire straits, you can take ADP and break it down into AMP, which means it only has one phosphate, M stands for mono, only has one ph uh, phosphate, and so if you get a buildup of this, that means, whoa, we really don't have all of the ATP because not only are we not breaking down ATP, but now we're taking ADP and breaking it down. If that builds up, that's going to stimulate that enzyme to make cellular respiration happen, so we start making more ATP. All right? And that is where we hold. All right.